Welcome back to us here, still on the search for a human humane architecture here in downtown Honolulu, uh, which one could call a construct of Holly, Holly's Hawaii. And that's the title of today's show. And our expert is uh, Dr. William Chapman, who allows us to call him Bill from now on. Yeah. And uh, Bill is uh, highly educated at the most prestigious places in the world, both nationally and internationally, meaning at Columbia and in Oxford. And he's currently a professor up at UH in Hawaiian studies, and at least as much also in the Department of Architecture where I'm teaching. So thank you, Bill, for being here with us. Martin, thanks for having me. It's been really a while getting on the show, and I'm glad you finally persevered and got me on. So, oh, thanks it's a for a pleasure. And I just want, as a disclaimer right away, I want to say that Haole Hawaii was definitely your title, right? So, <laughs> I'm, I'm very used to take the blame. That's uh, that's very. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm common. innocent, innocent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. No, that's good. But for, let's say, since this is an edutaining program and format, let's uh, inform the audience who might not be from here, because this could be viewed and, and heard all over the world. What in the world are Haoli's? Well, as you know, and many people know, Haoli is a term that was used by the Hawaiian population to describe outsiders, people who are coming from somewhere else. And from what I understand, it means without language, really but also sort of without breath and soul to some degree as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of remember this was a place where nobody had ever met anyone who didn't speak Hawaiian language, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. so, they never, so that howly stuck, and that <coughs> is still a term that's widely used today to describe people from the mainland of the U.S. I always use the even more catchy description, which is that it means the one without breath. And when Cook came, he uh, did not do what the Hawaiians did, actually smell each other's breath when they welcome each other. So they said, he's the one without breath. And uh, that makes how, sense. how he ended is a, is a story that most people know as well. Right. So, uh, but let's go the other way around, uh, what maybe Haoli's did to Hawaii. And, uh, but before we do that, let's look at how people here were doing it before they got contacted, which is actually another term, right? You get the, you get the pre-contact and the post-contact. So this is an image here of, because this is an architecture show here, how people dwelled on the island pre-contact. Right. This was a probably early 20th century, maybe late 19th century photograph of a, <clears throat> of a Holly Peely. There could be different kinds of vegetation used for the covering, but Peely grass, which was a kind of grass that grew near the seashore, kind of a stock, a thick stock grass, not a grass that was used, as we're more familiar with the grasses that are used for feeding animals, which is all pretty much an import from other places when they brought it in for cattle grazing and things. So this was a grass that Hawaiians would harvest and use for building houses, particularly those near the shores. Mm -hmm. If up in the mountains, you might have other materials that were used and ferns and other things as well. And sometimes ferns were used to decorate them. <clears throat> and they suited, very much suited the needs of Hawaiians. They mm -hmm. were, in a way, buildings that could be replaced after storms or replaced periodically as, they, as maybe um, the uh, structure began to fail or the grass needed replacing. These are all mm -hmm. aspects to it. And Hawaiians made permanent architecture. They made mainly temples, which were made out of fieldstone or rubble. And, uh, but and those often included other components, like wood components and things like that, too. Um, they had wind towers for telling the future and telling fortunes and speaking to the gods, and they would usually have Holly Peely within them. But mm -hmm. basically, most people lived in a form of Holly Peely. Mm -hmm. um, so as most indigenous cultures, they made it from scratch, right? Here in particular, mm -hmm. <laughs> because there was no other place to get it from, right. so they had to basically do that. And there was probably status represented in it as well. The simplest ones were a little less than pup tents, really. They were mm -hmm. like just two, mm -hmm. <clears throat> two uprights forming a triangle. Mm -hmm. The more elaborate mm -hmm. ones had a kind of bow shape to them, and usually had a very low door. I mean, you could argue even that this door main 
already show the influence of Western civilization or Western influence just by the fact that it's kind of a bigger door. Mm -hmm. Most of the doors and the really old representations of Holly Peely mm -hmm. are quite close to the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some people argue that the, the, when you started getting vertical walls that that was a Western influence, but some of the early images suggest that some of the buildings actually did have kind of vertical walls. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things is the whole way of man making them and tying them is very similar to the same craft involved in building canoes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're adding outriggers to canoes or mm -hmm. putting up masts and things mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. there was a kind of continuity mm -hmm. and lashing technique and the materials. Was, they're usually made out of senate, which is a kind of um, um, taken from coconut husk, making a a kind of cordage, and then the cordage was used for tying, and they didn't mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. really pins, and they certainly didn't use metal because they didn't mm -hmm. have any metal to work with. Mm -hmm. They were little bits of iron in Hawaii at that time. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> and then they got contacted, right? right? And everything changed right. in their entire life, including architecture, which is mostly an expression <coughs> and embodiment of societal developments. So, how did that go? Well, I think. You know, it varied. Like that picture shows, there were Hawaiians living in grass houses well into the early part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But I think by the 1920s, they were really a rarity. Mm -hmm. I remember coming across the articles in the Hilo paper when they were building a rail link for the sugar plantation, they'd come across an old holly peely. So mm -hmm. really, there weren't very many left. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a kind of nostalgic element, the little grass shack in mm -hmm. Hawaii, mm -hmm. is a famous song as well. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> gradually, um, Hawaiians had moved into um, buildings mainly made out of wood. If you look at early images of Honolulu, there were grass houses in Honolulu into a really late period, into well into the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, quite typically, they would cake them with mud by that point because not so much to create a stronger roof but really to keep the animals. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of grazing, moving animals at that point and mm -hmm. they wanted to keep them from chewing on the mm -hmm. roofs so they put mud on them and protect them. They also faced the importation of different kinds of insects and other pests. Now, they had rats already, but they didn't have a lot of, like, the, some of the termites and things like that we have now were probably not here then. Mm -hmm. And so once you started getting insect pests, they became much less comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hawaiians adapted them. They put in windows. Mm -hmm. and some of the earliest representations show sort of vertical double-hung windows being put in at the ground level where they would open sideways like a mm -hmm. slider mm -hmm. that would provide mm -hmm. ventilation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you could see that in response to European traditions, they started bigging, building really bigger hollies, particularly for churches and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. so, um, but eventually you started getting the use more of wood construction was really typical and stone construction. Mm -hmm. and stone construction they understood, but they didn't understand it from a European point of view with a lot of set in mortar with walls with plates and then building roofs over these elements. So some of the earliest Western settlers, you know, people like John Young over on the Big Island who had actually been more or less um, abducted by King Kamehameha um, to serve in his military and later serve as an advisor, he built a kind of complicated compound over in a uh, quite high on the Big Island, and it was a kind of combination of a kind of a Welch homestead and a uh, and a Hawaiian house compound. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a little bit of both cultures. So you did get this kind of hybridity. Yeah, early yeah, on. yeah. And maybe one <laughs> keynote is as well uh, plantation home, and then maybe Dicky because you mentioned roofs. Maybe you want to talk about these. Yeah, yeah. Well, <coughs> some of the earliest. Buildings. Some were actually, there was actually a short period of building with um, adobe or mud brick construction. There were a sizable number of people from Mexico and that area who brought this technology with them. And one of the things that mud brick construction required was a kind of roof that would dramatically overhang. Mm -hmm. It would protect it from the rain. Mm -hmm. So it became kind of common. And there was a... Um, Examples you can still see at Waioli on the, the island of Kauai. 
it's not mud brick, it's actually stone construction with plaster over it, but it has this very steep pitched roof with kind of a sides that go like this. It kind of has, a, it's got a, well, it's really a second, a double pitch, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So architectural historians would call it a bell cast roof mm -hmm. and a kind of like a square bell. Mm -hmm. And what this was was to provide a sort of space around the building to shed water. Uh, Kalma Kapili Church in Honolulu was very much the same kind of construction. And uh, <clears throat> originally, both of these buildings were probably covered with pili grass. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, they got covered with cedar shingle, which was a, were imported from the Pacific Northwest, and they were used commonly. But the pitch was necessary for the original covering, with, for the covering with the uh, pili grass. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the double pitch was because if you were to follow the angle of the steep roof down, you wouldn't have room to walk underneath it. You mm -hmm. actually had to have the double pitch to give you head space. Mm -hmm. So and then when they were covered with shingles, they continued that tradition. Shingles don't require quite as steep a pitch, but they also require a steep pitch. And in fact, at the time, it's interesting that some of the famous architects you probably talked about in the other series, C.W. Dickey and Hart Wood, some mm -hmm. of these guys actually were involved in the restoration of these buildings. In mm -hmm. fact, Hart Wood worked on the Wyoli mission in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And so he was familiar with this kind of construction. And C.W. Dickey worked on the mission house in Honolulu mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. 1920s mm -hmm. when it was converted from having once been a kind of girls' school mm -hmm. um, for Hawaiian kids and then was turned into a uh, um, uh, museum. Mm -hmm. So this is really part of this, back to your term, Howley, the mm -hmm. kind of period in the 1920s when the kind of well-established Euro-American families were beginning to see their history in a kind of, in terms we now think of as historic preservation. Yeah, yeah, they wanted yeah. to kind of tell the story yeah. of pioneering life, and they mm -hmm. were really trying to tell that story. Not the mm -hmm. story of Hawaiian life, but the story of the little house in the prairie, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Surrounded by the savage's idea, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not surprising that C.W. Dickey and Hartwood and, and others proponents of this, Ray Morris was another, mm -hmm. of this kind of Hawaii regionalist style that mm -hmm. really gets started in the teens but really takes off in the 20s and 30s, that that would have been a kind of signature element. Mm -hmm. This double pitched roof mm -hmm. became very mm -hmm. important to them. And so now everybody, even my kids who grew up in Hawaii, they all say, hey dad, there's a dicky roof. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so that's what you see. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Before we go into our little minatory break, uh, Hardwoods, by the way, our friend Don Hibbert has written books, and one right, of them he, is about Hardwood. And, and Ben Mason did a really nice book on Hardwood. Yeah. And there's one, there's one <coughs> project, his latest work, which is the Board of Water Supply, which basically breaks free from the traditional. I love the Board of Water and, Supply and, building. I think, I don't know if you have a picture of it to show, but it's probably my favorite it's, building, and yeah. I was a disconcerted the other day to hear that someone from the planning department at UH is being brought in to discuss how they might treat the area we call the capital district around mm -hmm, the capital, mm -hmm, and they mm -hmm. said it was out of alignment, and oh. so it needed to be taken down, what? <laughs> which is really mm -hmm. disturbing. Oh my but God. it may be Queen's Hospital. Well, now we need the down. break to catch a breath <laughs> and then vent about that after the break. <laughs> okay. Be back in a minute. I've got the Beagle Sisters here with a healthy tip. We encourage you to enjoy the food you eat this holiday season and keep it local and healthy. Yeah. Eat the rainbow. Eat yeah. the rainbow. And if you need any produce, come to the Red Barn on the North Shore. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. Aloha, this is Kili'i Akina with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us. We'll see you then. Aloha. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. 
See you then. <laughs> okay. We're back to Bill with Holly Hawaii today. And if we can get picture two and, and three will he click after each other, that's more the mainstream. Um, one is picture two is, is uh, basically couple A. This is what we find today. This is a very, I like to call it, allow myself to call it an invasive American. This is not the best of the best of American because there was good stuff, even suburban stuff, the case study houses and things like that. So this is the most watered down of the American dream. And picture three, which is also our permanent background, is basically the high rise. Right, right. So both these, however, we have to say in all these, you know, you find better buildings than, than, than worse buildings. But still, it's, it's pretty much a, uh, an imported, to say the least, and we allow ourselves to say an invasive um, fabric that's imported. However, if we get to the picture number four, um, uh, this is, we came from the Board of Water Supply and Hardwood with your favorite building of his, which you see endangered, and we got to really work on that. And uh, so that was segueing into a modern era, and that was basically sort of uh, promoted by a, a rather tragic event in history, right? Um, my thought, Martin, is really World War II, and I know you had DeSoto Brown on before, but no, just World War II is really the pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess we could see Hartwood's building as pivotal, but it was already in the post-war period, mm -hmm. and it was his effort to kind of come to grips with modernism, mm -hmm. where he came from really what we would have mm -hmm. to call mm -hmm. a Beaux-Arts architectural tradition, which mm -hmm. was based very much on a formal plan, a sense of hierarchy, you know what the front door is, all these things that mm -hmm. architects were trained in, mm -hmm. whether they were in Germany or whether they were in Denmark or mm -hmm. most famously in France, the mm -hmm. Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And so that building is neat because it has this sort of brise kind of the Corbusier influenced modernism with a kind of Chinese pavilion mm -hmm. entrance area, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. gives hierarchy to the building. Yeah. So he managed to kind of evoke something of Asia as well. And, and these and uh, gentlemen on some of that, mm -hmm. right, in, in Hawaiian architecture, yeah. or architecture in Hawaii in the post war period. And these three gentlemen, and there are more, but this right. the three people, persons, men in the center of the picture are actually the next generation. And they actually learned under Hardwood and they learned under Dickey. Right. Will you tell us who they are? Well, we're going to talk about just three of them who yes. I can identify. Mm -hmm. um, Vladimir Osipov is grinning down below. With, he's got the mustache. Mm -hmm. Pete Wimberley's up behind him. Pete Wimberley formed a firm that would become international. Mm -hmm. And then to the right is um, 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 Alfred Price. Alfred Price, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And he was actually, weirdly, for a short period imprisoned during World War II just because he was German. Mm -hmm. Austrian, was, to be, to well, be more Sorry, correct, you're right, but, but because they still were suspect, but, right? But, but maybe, by that point, but, Austria had become German. And right? that's fair enough. And my, my mother being Austrian, <laughs> hi, mom, that's, I can totally relate to that. As a post-German <laughs> invasion, right? So anyway, he, um, he would go on to design the Arizona Memorial in mm -hmm. 1962, which is his most famous building. But I think you had pictures of other buildings he did as well. And we can actually, that's the <coughs> second to last picture. Um, is um, I, I picked intentionally buildings because you were, uh, and this is good because it's actually even uh, located very close to your favorite hardwood building. And it, and it applies a, a similar pattern which we can call bioclimatic because the fins of the of the board water supply are uh -huh. decorative, but uh -huh. they're performatively decorative exactly, because they actually exactly. cool the building. And they block the sun during mm -hmm, particular mm -hmm, times of the day. Mm -hmm. That's what the whole brise soleil means, you know, the yeah. sun blind, basically. Well, I think, you know, both Osipov, Osipov had started doing fairly traditionalist buildings in the 30s. He was doing kind of some of this regional stuff, but kind of some of his houses would look like Dickey houses, mm -hmm, really. Mm -hmm. Some were kind of looked like suburban houses in California, mm -hmm, sort of mm -hmm. um, Monterey style and things mm -hmm. like that. There's one in Manoa that's very mm -hmm. typical of that time period. But I think in the post-war period, they really were trying to think of an architecture that um, would speak to Hawaii. So there, you do have this group of people that were still interested in Hawaiian regionalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important, and all mm -hmm. three of them address that in different ways. Um, 
This picture, by the way, if we can go back for a second uh, to the second to last picture, is uh, when we see our friend Don Hibbert here and yeah. uh, one woman from the church and the guy to the right is my dear mentor Robert McCarter who has written so many books about Lucan, Frank Lloyd Wright, yeah, I think and I met him once at Alba the Alto and, right. and many more and uh, he was here so uh, we, we gave him a tour and we heard uh, the, the woman from the church shared, she said, well, it's recently getting, getting hot in the church and we said, has it always been like that? And she says, no. And we said, what was different? Well, there was some green that um, the planters were rotting and um, we took them down. And this is almost similar to what you <coughs> share with us, the shocking news of some people thinking about doing something to the board of water supply. She shared with us, well, an architect is consulting in what they could do for a shading. We just said, well, bring back mm -hmm. what it was, the original, because there was some intent. I mean, mm -hmm. vegetative facades for shading, we wish we would have that these days, and there is actually, you know, tendencies in the in the world in contemporary modern architecture. Our students uh, suggest that a lot. So just just bring this back, right? Yeah, I think probably the most famous. I mean, there's a kind of direct link between this maybe and the Outrigger Club by Osipov. Yeah. Oh yeah. Both of them were trying to come to grips with this new era of concrete construction. Mm -hmm. it kind of comes out of Europe. It comes out mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. tradition of Le Corbusier and people like that. But it definitely um, was going to be the building material from mm -hmm. the 1950s yeah. on. Yeah. And certainly wood construction was, other than for much smaller scale buildings like houses, mm -hmm. was not going mm -hmm. to be popular. And people were getting used. I think during World War II, one thing DeSoto may have mentioned was even that's when really some of the most voracious termites arrived in Hawaii as a result of the mm -hmm. shipping of materials mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. that time. And uh, um, so and that, that's that a, was a, had an impact on it. Yeah. So they, I think they thought the, the, the concrete would have a feeling of kind of permanence. That was mm -hmm. a kind of notion of modernism as well, a kind of a time-stopping quality. Yeah. There, there was an architecture that wasn't just in the sequence of new yeah. buildings. It was a new architecture that was ending all the rules, right? And, and this is a perfect, <coughs> our producer brings in the perfect picture, the, another project by Ossipop uh -huh. that embodies <coughs> that perfectly. And again, right. this commitment to trying to figure out how you make them kind of energy, um, not energy efficient, but comfortable, basically. Taking advantage of the breezes, taking advantage of vegetation trying to make them open, kind of embracing the climate of Hawaii, which I know is a cause of yours, right? It is, <coughs> it is and these are the grandfathers of right. that movement. But, but as you see, even at the airport these days, the, the, the late 20th century was the age of concrete. I'm afraid that maybe the early 21st century is the age of air conditioning. <laughs> and that's there are some be. scary tendencies at the airport too to so yeah, yeah, to Hawaiianize that more and give it some it more give it some sheet rocky ornaments. Uh -huh. Which, by the way, you tell me the Hawaiian. You talked about symbolism, but compared to other uh, Asian Pacific cultures that you're an expert in, the Hawaiians were very relatively little symbolic. Right? They were actually pretty. Um, rational in their in their gestures, right? Well, they certainly had representation and symbolism of stuff, but mm -hmm. I can see what you mean. They were forced by necessity to some degree to be mm -hmm. kind of practical mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. bit Vitruvian in architectural yeah. terms, no, that's, right? That's a great compliment to them. Uh -huh. and, and the last the last picture is now the third person who is Pete Wimmer Lee who is uh, mostly, and DeSoto and I are going to talk about the Hilton Hawaiian Village in some of the next shows. So, you know, some of uh, Pete's work is, which I feel is dismissed, and maybe for some, you know, good reason as being tiki architecture. Yeah, There's a lot of that. I, I, I think he really was trying to go beyond tiki. If you yeah. look at his earlier buildings, um, mm -hmm. um, I think he was trying to draw upon kind of the culture of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. He wasn't trying, I mean, the tiki movement is really something that comes out of California, as mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. it had to do with World War II as well. Mm -hmm. It comes out of the Broadway show, South Pacific. It comes out of the bars that these guys had become familiar with when they Don, were traveling around the Don Pacific. Don the Beachcomber. And, and all that. Mm -hmm. And Don the Beachcomber mm -hmm. was a, in California who literally changed his name mm -hmm. legally to mm -hmm. Beachcomber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Started 
this um, movement, and it became very popular. And then yeah. it kind of sort of, it was sort of like a wave. It started, in some ways starts in Hawaii, washes up in California with the servicemen after the mm -hmm. war, and then comes back to Hawaii. But yeah. I think Wimberley was always trying to do something beyond that. He was. And trying the, the, to locate something in place. Right? And that picture we saw, I just <coughs> took this the other day, um, at sunset, and uh, I was uh, talking to Rob here that um, us having been in the desert and knowing the saguaro cactus, if you cut a section through the horizontal section through the saguaro cactus, you, you see, um, or even when you look at it, you see itself shading. So through this undulation of shape, there's always certain parts in the shade, so it keeps it hydrated or mm -hmm. prevents it from dehydrating. And this building here, and I have to give a compliment uh, to Kamehameha School and Bob Oda, who is, uh, uh, you know, anytime we are in touch, I, I said, I know, Bob, you don't like the building because you constantly are going around and doing the spalling repair because these fins are so amazingly thin and right, they didn't right, have fiber sense. reinforcement. <coughs> so it's always spalling off, but they always go around and repair it. And, and I have to you know, uh, thank them for that because this would be a, a building that would be a pity to, to see go because it's truly a, a marvel of, of a blend. I think that's your point of, of, so these people came, they're all, let's say again, Osipov was Russian but grew up in Japan. Uh, Prize was Austrian and Wimbledon was American. So they were from all over the place and they certainly brought the best from their culture. Right. But different to these days where architects come also still, Richard Meyer and other people come for the big developers and are less sensitive about uh, the specificity of Hawaii. And these guys were very, very devoted and, and respectful okay. and said, we want to blend the best of what, what we have, what we bring, right. with the best of what we find. Is well, that probably fair? a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one reason would be simply back in the 50s, it was more of a commitment to come to Hawaii and be here. You couldn't just mm -hmm. kind of fax it off or mm -hmm. send a, mm -hmm. as an, an attachment from your offices in New York, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you actually had to experience the place to some degree. <clears throat> that probably had an impact too. <clears throat> I'm looking at that picture in my mind now of the varsity building and I can't help but think that <clears throat> I'm also disappointed to have lost the C.W. Dickey design sort of deco, sort of inspired varsity okay. theater, which All was right. in the parking lot at that point. That's it. We that run out of tragic time. tragic loss. <laughs> it, it was. And we take that as, uh, as a motivation for doing another show, Bill. Yeah, we so do about something on preservation next time, right? Thank you. We do. So much to talk about. Thank you very much for having been here. Much Thanks, friends.